Okay, so the actually the, the whole question of good and evil, you know, as to whether whether a given uh, paradigm is a good one or a bad one, uh, has a lot of relevance to today's lecture because in the, the previous two lectures I had been speaking as if the Hermeticists were the good guys, right? And to a large extent, I happen to believe that's true. We talked about the Hermetic colonists in, in early America, the, the strange and eccentric. Uh, uh, experimental uh, communards of the woman in the wilderness and other other examples of pure Rosicrucian, Hermetic, or Masonic mysticism in early American history. And in the second lecture, we went to the 19th century and saw how these ideas survived, expanded, and thrived, and became major social movements in the middle of the 19th century. And then we ended by showing how all that ferment, all that frontier ferment of America up to 18, up to the mid 19th century was snipped off by the end of the frontier and also by the Civil War, which was a direct result of the ending of the frontier, the closing of the frontier, the filling up of the map. Now, in this lecture tonight, I'm going to take the opposite point of view. As it says in the catalog entry, uh, you know, if you admit angels into history, as we do, and as, we, as I did when I spoke of the woman in the wilderness, uh, then uh, demons tend to creep in, you know, through the back door. And pretty soon you have a demonification of history. And this is something greatly to be feared. Uh, the, you know, the demon theory of history is what gives rise to uh, pogroms and persecutions and paranoid politics. So uh, with a big grain of salt, right, now I'm presenting this material. I, I've got my tongue slightly in my cheek here. And um, I don't mean to present for you a devil theory of American history to match or counterbalance the perhaps the angel theory of American history that I was spooning out before. Uh, all I'm trying to show is that um, dialectics is a complicated thing. Uh, I talked about the yin yang disc before. How the yin yang disc has a little bloop of white on the, in the in the midst of the black, and a little bloop of of black in the midst of the white. And I would like to coin the term tonight in your honor, Taoist dialectics, okay? which, in, in which instead of talking about the thesis and the antithesis and the synthesis in a sort of a crude Hegelian way, we'll admit a little of the antithesis into the thesis and a little of the thesis into the antithesis, and then we'll start to spin them around like a disc and see what color the resulting uh, hallucination becomes. <laughs> so Taoist dialectics. Uh, you're welcome to share the uh, glory of the invention of this new concept. Um, and uh, the thing about, I was talking about hermeneutics as a um, analysis of symbolism, the thing which the traditional symbolist uh, thinkers, up to and including Jung, never really tell you is that uh, beyond, well, all right, first of all, from the traditional point of view, a symbol both is and represents the thing that it is. Uh, however, uh, it's not that simple. And the more you study symbolism, the more you realize that anything can symbolize anything, especially its opposite. And here we have the Taoist uh, dialectic, the image of the, uh, of the disc again. Since there is a little of the black inside the white, the white comprehends the black. It is identified with it in some way, perhaps a mystical way or perhaps just a geographical <coughs> way, but there is this, uh, this identity, do, identity does occur so that in the end you find yourself seeing that black symbolizes white and white symbolizes black. And uh, hence, you know, great moral confusion arises in the mind of the symbolic an uh, analyst. And uh, that moral confusion is what this, essay, what this uh, paper tonight is about. So uh, what we're going to talk about is the inversion of hermetic symbolism. Now, any, any, I just said that any symbol can invert, can, can turn into its mirror image, can turn into its opposite. I would say that there is a benign inversion of symbolism and a malign inversion of symbolism. So that, um, for example, let's say that uh, when, the, when the assassins, the Ismailis, um, said that the Islamic law was abrogated and that they would give it an esoteric interpretation so that instead of physically praying five times a day, what it meant was that you should remember God five times a day, inwardly. 
and that would be the, or, or you should remember God all the time, actually, not, not at given hours, but, but in a constant state of esoteric realization. This is a kind of benign inversion of the symbolism of divine law. If, let's say, some kind of hypothetical Charles Mansonoid Satanist were to talk about the abrogation of divine law, he would be talking about a malign inversion in which instead of do good, the law would then become do evil. So symbolism does these weighty flip-flops, you know. It's a, it, it, it's a complicated, subtle, it's a subtle science. And um, I want to take a brief look today at one trend of mysticism in American history which has both a malign and a benign side to it for me, and that is basically Freemasonry. Um, to put the end of my argument at the beginning, just to let you know where I'm coming from here, because Freemasonry is a, uh, always has been a hot topic. I'm a big admirer of Freemasonry, <coughs> uh, very much the same way my friend Robert Anton Wilson is, in that Freemasonry has been a revolutionary, uh, a mystical revolutionary movement. And in as much as it's Freemasonry concerns the overthrowing of oppressive deities and governments, I've always found it a fascinating and uh, heartening thing to study. In as much as Freemasonry seems to involve the idea of a secret cabal <coughs> of elitists who control, uh, control, manipulate and control society through uh, the manipulation and control of imagery uh, for uh, ends concerning their own power and the power of their class, um, you know, I tend uh, not to like masonry and to think of it as a, as a dark force. But sometimes these things happen absolutely simultaneously. You have masonry which is struggling uh, in a revolutionary direction, but at the same time acting like an elitist cabal. So, do I admire or do I not admire? Do I condemn or do I praise? I don't know. I try to be a Taoist dialectician. <laughs> and go with the flow. So we'll flow, let's flow back to a certain date where I want to start in the middle of things and then we'll go backwards from that date and then we'll go come and go forwards from that date. The date is 1717, nice mystical sounding number. It was in fact the year that the Grand Lodge, uh, the Freemasonic Grand Lodge was founded in London. Um, a rather unremarkable occurrence as far as uh, official history is concerned. A bunch of uh, good gentlemen who like their meat and drink, uh, meeting in, in the upstairs rooms of certain taverns in London, and who had belonged to what appeared to be a sort of trade union uh, uh, society to do with masonry, to do with you know, bricklaying and building, the making of buildings. Um, decided to form a Grand Lodge to organize all the little local lodges of Freemasonry that existed at that time <coughs> under, one, uh, under one organizational roof, so to speak, and give, the, the, give Freemasonry a new, or to give it some kind of direction. We don't know what that direction really consisted of in their minds. It was a secret society. It had been a real secret society. Now it was just sort of showing its head above water to a certain extent. It was not going to uh, maintain an attitude of complete secrecy. People would now know that there was such a thing as Freemasonry. <coughs> but would we ever understand what Freemasonry is or was? That's another question entirely. In order to understand it, I mean, um, the, in a nutshell, the Masonic myth is Temple of Solomon, uh, ancient mysteries of building coming, from, uh, coming up with the, from, from Solomon and David in the Old Testament. Um, all through history, the Masons carrying this uh, this, uh, mystical, this mystical burden through, through the ages, um, and it surfaces in, uh, in some magic way uh, in 1717 in London. Pretty shoddy stuff, actually, the, the basic legend. And historians have done one or two things with this legend. Either they've looked at Masonry and said, oh, this is all a bunch of mumbo jumbo, there's nothing here worth studying, this is silly, um, or, actually three approaches. Another, the other approach is the right-wing paranoid approach. Mm -hmm. The secret societies, they're up to something. I know they're going to subvert the church, the state, you know, um, they're going to steal my wife, everything. <laughs> then uh, they, caused, they caused the French Revolution, they caused the Communist Revolution. You know, we'll get into some of that analysis. Then the, uh, the, third, the third position is to try to be a historian. Okay, where are the documents, you know? What can we understand as provable and what can we understand as 
as not provable but, but reasonable in the context of other documents, and so forth and so on. Scientific historical approach to masonry. And this has been extraordinarily difficult because it's a secret society. They don't write stuff down. When they do write something down, it's likely to be a lie. I mean, you know, an outright lie. Uh, so, um, as a result, even though the great Francis Gates, whom I told you all about in the first lecture, the woman who wrote the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, who really was the doyenne of all Renaissance occult studies that have gone on <coughs> since the 40s and 1940s and 50s, she managed to tackle Rosicrucianism. No one has ever done that job for Masonry. There is no one standard, solid, historical, scientific, and at the same time sympathetic study of Masonry. They're all written by, by cranks with axes to grind, or if they're written by serious scholars, they're, they're incredibly boring because they can't discover anything interesting. So, you know, what can we do? We have to take a, a somewhat different approach and my approach is basically to go to the cranks uh, more than to the scholars, um, at, but to try to weigh their evidence in the light of other things that we can learn about the history of, of, of a given period. So um, <coughs> the first thing that we want to look at is a, as a, uh, an, ori uh, an origin of Greek masonry is in fact Rosicrucianism. In, um, 1614, the Fama Fraternitatis, and then a couple of years later, the Confessio. These were Latin texts that came out. They were probably written by a, uh, a German-speaking Protestant minister named Johann Andre, who's otherwise not known for anything at all. But they were presented as, in a very mysterious way as documents and, and really manifestos emanating from a mysterious international brotherhood of adepts who were uh, uh, Protestant, liberal, tolerant in religion, deeply interested in the hermetic sciences and out, out to work for the betterment of, the human, of, of humankind. It was very idealistic, uh, a proposition, and at the same time very mysterious and intriguing. Immediately all the uh, hermetically inclined intellectuals of Europe uh, immediately tried to start trying to find out who had written these things, where was the Rosicrucian society, can I join, I think I'm good enough, you know, and they would write these essays about hermeticism or occultism or alchemy and dedicate them to the Rosicrucian society and then hope for something in the mail, you know, and nothing, and nothing ever showed up for any of them, or, or maybe it did, you know, or maybe it did, but uh, chances are that this was a sort of a, a sort of a hoax. That Andre was basically hoaxing people with the uh, with the Thomas Fraternitatis, but the hoax took on a real life. So much so that now there's now a huge building out in San Jose, California, uh, called the Rosicrucian Society. You know, I mean, it, it's it still it, it exists now if it didn't in 1614. Uh, but uh, among the, the among the first people to really get hot hotted up by by the, the Rosicrucian story were the already existing Masons, who. Um, the hypothesis would go had been la had largely been a trade organization, but did have some kind of uh, mystical uh, uh, ritual behind them, and had started to allow gentlemen and aristocrats to join as honorary uh, masons, uh, not operative masons, but what were called speculative masons. So this process had, it was just getting underway around 1590 in Scotland. This is where it was happening. Um, Around, um, around, around 1590 to 1600 to 1610, uh, we start to get some documentation on Scottish Freemasonry, which indicates that it had already been in existence for a long time. Um, for example, uh, at, at around this time, a certain Lord Sinclair was, was, was said to be, had the hereditary right to be warden of all Freemasons, and that this right uh, one goes back from a quote from age to age right, for a very long time. Well, you know, mystical societies are always trying to say that they've been around for a very long time. But in this case, there's some really interesting um, clues that lead one to think that there might be something to this Sinclair story. The Sinclair in question was a drunken nobody. Uh, he was not at all the kind of person you would choose to be the head of anything. Um, apparently, he ended up uh, uh, a bigamy case. Uh, he was both, you know, beat. He had several wives whom he beat when he was drunk. I mean, he's really not a very cool guy. And, but he was made head of all the Masons because of his hereditary right. 
Um, his family had built a Masonic church in Rosslyn, Scotland, which is still there, the Rosslyn Chapel. It's full of Masonic imagery. This is all before 1717, mind you, when the British in London founded the Grand Lodge. We're now going back in history, going backwards. Um, and let's see, yes, accused of fornication and drunkenness and actually ended up in Ireland. In 1736, <laughs> in 1736, which is after the founding of the Grand Lodge, when the Scottish Lodges got around to forming the Grand Lodge, there was yet another member of the Sinclair family who at that time renounced this hereditary right in return for which he was elected first Grand Master of the Scottish Grand Lodge. And the Sinclair family is still around and they're still deeply involved in Scottish Masonry, as far as I know. So who were these Sinclairs? Uh, and who, in fact, were the aristocratic members who seemed uh, patron, the, the aristocratic patrons that Masonry always somehow, as it comes out of the mist of time, it seems to already arrive with this aristocratic patronage. Um, jumping back, let's see. It, oh, I should also um, emphasize here that, uh, that there was a direct link with uh, continental Rosicrucian and Hermetic thinkers here because Giordano Bruno, who was the great Italian hermeticist whom I mentioned, who was burned at the stake for, for heresy in Rome, during his visit to Britain had a, a disciple named uh, Alexander Dixon, who was Scottish and who later showed up as being very much involved in the foundation of uh, masonry in Scotland in the, 15, in the 1590s to six, early uh, 1600s. So there really is a, you can prove the Rose, sort of Rosicrucian hermetic connection. And there were other very important figures like Elias Ashmole, who was the librarian of, well, he founded the Ashmolean. He's a great, great scholar and collector of manuscripts from the Elizabethan and, and immediately post-Elizabethan period who was known to, known to have been a Freemason. Um, so anyway, in answering the questions of where these, where these speculative Masons came from, these aristocratic Masons, um, we could go back even farther and talk about the Knights Templar, uh, the, the, the Knights of the Temple of, of Jerusalem. Of Jerusalem. Uh, now this was, uh, how many people have heard or studied a little something about Templarism? Hello. Uh, a few, okay. Well, in a nutshell, the Templars were a chivalric order of knights uh, founded within the Catholic Church to uh, work in the Crusades uh, to fight against Muslims and to take back the Holy Land, to conquer Jerusalem, and to liberate the site of Solomon's Temple. Ah, remember the Masons claimed also to descend from the builders of Solomon's Temple. Here are a bunch of European aristocrats showing up in the Holy Land uh, looking to liberate the Temple of Solomon. In 11, 1118, they were founded. So um, they had a, a reasonably... I have to really rush through a lot of this history, and I'm sorry for that because it's hard to get to any kind of luminous detail when you have to gallop over centuries this way. But uh, the Templars had a long and successful career as Crusader Knights, um, although, as with the uh, Europeans in general, they were gradually pushed out of the Holy Lands, uh, held on in uh, Cyprus for a while, and then Malta, and, and, and finally lost um, all of their eastern holdings and just r remained as a sort of monastic order. In the meanwhile, very interestingly, they had, in had invented modern banking. Uh, they, they invented the check, for example. As far as I can make out, they were first, the first, first people to, uh, to invent the uh, bank check. Uh, they were, became incredibly wealthy. Uh, they, they were answerable to no one but the Pope. They didn't have to uh, answer to any kings of individual countries. They were directly under the Pope. And using this, um, uh, this relationship with the Vatican, they were able to ship money around the world with the greatest of ease. They apparently did get into charging uh, usury. Well, that, this was a charge made against them at their trial, uh, and we really don't know about any of those charges, how accurate they are. But whatever, they were incredibly rich. They were probably the richest institution in the medieval world, uh, even though they had completely lost all connection with the Holy Land and their original purpose. So in 1307, the King of France decided to get hold of that money, basically. 
He needed it for his own uh, uh, early nationalist type expansion. He was a schemer, he was a wheeler dealer and a son of a bitch, and he decided to screw the Templars, or at least that's the Templar story. Um, he accused them of uh, heresy, sodomy, uh, the obscene kiss, uh, you know, uh, like the witches, they were supposed to have to kiss the arse of their uh, superior abbot, who was also their general. Um, they were accused of tromping on the crucifix, of having crucifixes inside their shoes so they could always walk on these two days. <laughs> they were accused of every blasphemy and sexual sin uh, that would titillate the masses at the time. And uh, most interestingly of all, they were accused of worshipping an idol, which was a, the head of a Turk that they called Bathomath. Uh So these were the accusations that were made against the Templars. There was a, the, the, uh, they were tried in French courts, and the king made sure that uh, none of them were uh, acquitted. Um, the evidence was just, was just presented. This is, the, this is as truth. And so we can never, again, we can never really be sure was this, uh, did, he have any, did the king have any case at all? Was there any truth in these charges against the Templars? Or was it the big lie? Did he invent the big lie all those centuries before Hitler and decide that, you know, if he just made up a really outrageous whopper that people would have to believe it? Uh, you know, maybe were the Templars perhaps engaged in certain heretical activities? On our assumption, they were. Uh, that is to say, perhaps, you know, we can forget about the spitting on Jesus and the sodomy, but the accusations of heresy are very interesting, very interesting indeed. Um, when the uh, French king uh, uh, persuaded the Pope to put out the uh, warrant for arrest for all the Templar knights, uh, some countries did it uh, obey more quickly than others. England was very, England under Edward I, who was very pro-Templar, was very slow to uh, go along with the order. And in Scotland, the order was never promulgated at all. The Templars had um, a lot of um, real estate and financial interests in Scotland. They were probably already very close to ruling circles there. They had connections, and they were not prescribed in Scotland. So, uh, furthermore, a large chunk of the Templar treasury disappeared, much to uh, the King of France's disgust. Uh, he was never able to put his hands on several shiploads of like solid gold. Okay. Where did it go? Where did the Templar knights who, who uh, fled France end up? The assumption is a lot of them ended up in Scotland. Uh, it's very logical. It's very logical that they would have ended up. It was the only European country where they had interests where they were not officially prescribed. So obviously they went to Scotland. Uh, in... Uh, in 1314, Edward I had died. He was replaced by his son, uh, the famous um, uh, sodomite Edward II, uh, said to be one of the worst kings that England ever had. I don't know. I'm no expert in English history. But uh, one thing he surely wanted to do was to conquer Scotland. And he was uh, working towards that, that end. There was a, a four-way battle for the Scottish throne going on at that time for historical reasons that I won't bore you with. And one of the uh, main contenders was the famous Robert the Bruce, who, as you probably know, won. Now, the way that he won was that in 1314, at the Battle of Bannock Burn, a mysterious mounted cavalry of knights wearing red crosses on their white surplices showed up and rode hell for leather out of the forest, completely unexpected by Ed Edward's uh, forces, and smashed them to smithereens. And the Battle of Bannockburn was such an overwhelming defeat for the English that they didn't try again for four centuries. The Scottish throne then survived, starting with Robert the Bruce as the new progenitor of it, uh, although he had family connections back to the ancient uh, Scottish line, survived until um, 1707. 1707. When, uh, uh, which was as you, uh, ten years before the English Masons were founded, okay? and that's when the Scottish throne finally fell, and uh, Scotland and England were united. Um, now, through this entire story, certain historians have managed to trace certain family names, the names of knights who were uh, who helped the Robert the Bruce, uh, who later apparently settled in certain villages. Uh, who put their names on tombstones or who put Templar shields on tombstones. 
and these same families along about um, the uh, late uh, uh, late 1400s or maybe, maybe the turn of the century um, suddenly these same graves or same family tombstone uh, series in the same villages start showing Masonic symbols um, the, uh, you know, the famous uh, crossed uh, um, compass and uh, you know, the, the star of uh, Solomon, the five-pointed star of Solomon, the six-pointed star of David, and so forth and so on. Begin showing up first in conjunction with the temp Templar uh, symbols, and then by themselves. And one of the major families that this is true of is the Sinclairs. So, uh, very recently, historians like John Robinson and also Bayesian and Lee, who wrote the uh, totally amazing book, uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, uh, which is uh, a complete, uh, which is a lot of fun, but it, it, it's a bunch of hooey in my opinion. Uh, also wrote a book called The Temple and the Lodge, in which they completely surprised me. They're still not exactly the most sober historians <laughs> around, but they really surprised me by doing arch doing homework, doing archaeological work, going out and photographing the graves, uh, referring to obs uh, really obscure uh, records in Scottish uh, uh, archives offices and so forth and so on, and they really, uh, and Robinson also found, well, I won't go into details, uh, these books are interesting, Born in Blood is the Robinson book, it's about the Templar connection, and uh, uh, Temple, The Temple in the Lodge by Basington Lee. And between these two books, it now looks like a very good bet that the same families who fought with Robert the Bruce ended up being these aristocratic supporters of masonry around 1590 or a little earlier when, when uh, speculative masonry begins to uh, emerge thanks to the, as I can say, like the comet of this Rosicrucian comet, the hoax, the Rosicrucian hoax, like a comet streaks across the sky and all the secret societies, the water begins to bubble and these sort of, you know, heads begin to pop up, Ooh, what was that, you know? And uh, um, masonry, in my, in my reading, had been waiting for such a moment. And now it's going to transform itself from an old uh, story of revenge and chivalry into a new story. Well, what was that new story to be? Uh, I'm not ready to get into that because I'm still going backwards. What, uh, where, if, if, the, uh, if the Templars were heretics, um, where did they get the idea of heresy? Well, who converted them from Orthodox Christianity, which at one time they were, the most Orthodox of the Orthodox? Who would have been the inspiration for their uh, lapse into heresy? Um, and uh, this is particularly acute if we believe the Templar origin of masonry, because, as, we, as you probably know, Masonry believes in religious toleration. It claims that it does not take part in religious wars, which at the time meant Protestant Catholic struggles. Um, it believes in a grand architect of the universe, which is, uh, should be acceptable to all religions. And, of course, this is the reason why the Catholic Church, for one, is always condemned for Masonry and excommunicated automatically anyone who was a Freemason because of this religious toleration. Now, if you were a Templar, uh, and you were looking for a religion to replace the one that you had been um, booted out of by the Pope and the King of France in this incredibly violent way, um, what sort of a heresy would you cook up? It might very well look like that. It might very well look like the basic Masonic idea of a belief in God but a rejection of organized religion uh, as, as a force for uh, constantly and violence in the world. And uh, it would, this would be even more uh, believable if we could say that the Templars had already been heretics before their fall. And um, as it happens, in the Holy Land, they did come into contact with the arch-heretics of all times, the assassins. The so-called uh, so assassins, the word is supposed to come from hashish, hashishin. This is actually etymologically quite unlikely, but it's a nice story. It was, uh, it was propagated by uh, Marco Polo, among others, uh, and um, this sort of romantic view of the of the Ismailis in the West as the, the drug crazed assassins. And there's some truth to it. Uh, the, uh, the they certainly were heretics, and they were despised as heretics by their fellow Muslims. 
their political technique was very interesting. They would conquer isolated mountain fortresses, which you could do in those days before airplanes and helicopters and so forth and so on, and hold them against all comers uh, by making the, uh, a system whereby they could um, uh, they would uh, fortify these castles and sort of you know settle their their people in the surrounding valley to grow food. They would always keep several years of food supply inside the castle. They would arrange for water supply inside the castle so they could withstand sieges that lasted virtually forever. Once they once you got these Ismailis in, into a certain place, it was really hard to pry them out. And um, they, uh, they were definitely in the game of assassination, both for power and money. And immediately they began assassinating, they began working for whoever would pay them the most in the crusade situation on the assumption that everybody was their enemies. So no matter who they knocked off, it was to their benefit. And if they could get paid for it, so much the better. So uh, the Europeans heard about these people right away. Uh, because what would happen is that, that uh, two Christian, seeming Arab Christians, of which there were still many and there are to this day, would show up and get a job with Count so-and-so from Flanders, you know. Oh, you know, I've got these two great Arab servants, they speak the language, everything's great. And at, at a moment, like in church, when everybody was watching, they would pull daggers out and stab them to death, and then they would stand there and wait to be killed. Very strange behavior. <laughs> very remarkable, and surely the European historians were very impressed. You know, the chroniclers all mentioned the, these uh, Count Raymond of, of uh, Count Raymond of Tripoli, or some of the most the, the, their most famous uh, victim. And as a result, uh, they they were uh, they got themselves involved in an incredible web work of enmity, enmities and alliances with all the Muslim factors and all the Christian factors in the Holy Land. They were working for and against everybody simultaneously, uh, very much like a, some uh, modern uh, intelligence conspiracy. In fact, you should keep that image in mind. <laughs> also, if there was anything to the drug story, you should keep in mind that they may have been raising money by selling drugs. It's also <laughs> sounds familiar <laughs> to people who follow modern intelligence history. Uh, a lot of interesting things about these mailers. They happen to be a major obsession of mine. I could go on and on about them at great lengths, but I did want to just read you one selection from a historian to give you an idea of the complexity of relations that were going on uh, during the Crusades. The, the Knights Hospitallers, who were the biggest rivals of the Templars, and who in fact inherited all of their uh, buildings and a lot of their money when they fell. They were always the rivals, and then after the Templars fell, the Hospitallers were their bitter enemies uh, because they actually benefited from the fall of the Templars. So the Hospitallers, uh, who had been uh, highly displeased with the dealings between the Nazar, the, the assassins, and Frederick II, the famous uh, King Frederick II, demanded tribute from the assassins, who refused by boasting that they themselves were then receiving gifts and payments from Frankish emperors and kings, French. Thereupon, the hospitalers attacked the assassins and carried off much booty. By 1228, the Syrian assassins had become tributaries to the hospitalers as well as to the Templars, there are hints to the effect that the assassins were now actually allied with the hospitalers. On hearing this news, Pope Gregory IX wrote a letter in 1236 to his representatives in the Holy Land strongly condemning such relations. The last important event in the history of the assassins of this period relates to the dealings between their chief, the famous Sinan al-Rashid, uh, who really was a, 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 a genius, uh, and Louis IX, better known as Saint Louis, the French king who led the Seventh Crusade. These dealings, recorded by the chronicler Joan Ville, uh, the king's biographer and secretary, occurred in uh, 1250. Uh, assassin emissaries came to the French king and asked him either to pay tribute to their chief or at least release the assassins from the tribute which they themselves paid to the Templars and the Hospitallers. On the intervention of a couple of, of uh, knights, uh, the Grand Masters of the Temple and the Hospital and the negotiations between the Old Man and the Mountain and Saint Louis, Saint Louis the King eventually led to no results. Saint Louis himself more interested in establishing friendly relations with the Mongols, who were then popping up on the horizon, uh, did not pay any tribute to the assassins, who had to continue paying their own tribute to the Hospitalers and the Templars, but the French King and the Syrian uh, assassin chief exchanged gifts 
and it was in the course of these embassies that the Arabic-speaking friar Yves Le Breton met the old man of the mountain and discussed religious doctrines with him, which is on record. And it was also at this time that there was a, that Joinville says that the assassins offered to convert to Christianity if the king, if Saint Louis would help them uh, get out from under the uh, the uh, hospitalers and the Templars. So they were they were playing footsie with everybody, right? And we can assume that uh, that uh, they weren't always at odds with the Templars. Sometimes they were working with the Templars against the hospitalers and the other Europeans. Not to mention the Mongols, the Orthodox Sunni uh, Caliphate at Baghdad, all the players. Uh, so really, um, very sort of CIA MI5 kind of behavior on the part of the assassins. Here. And uh, I don't didn't mean you to understand or follow that at all. I just gave it you as an example of total mind-bending complexity. Right? <laughs> uh, so, um, if the uh, to repeat, I'm oh, sorry. If the uh, Templars had any inspiration at all to become assassins, uh, an assumption has been made by conspiracy buffs and amateur historians, largely that this influence would have come from the assassins. Now, who were the assassins? Um, were they Hermeticists? Were they Manichaeans? Were they Gnostic dualists? Were they uh, Muslims, but bad Muslims? And what exactly were they? Um, that's a very difficult question. Again, uh, playing the Taoist dialectician, all, all of those things were present in the Ismaili tradition and more, and also not present in certain ways. Um, they certainly knew the Corpus Hermeticum. There was the famous uh, ninth century group of sages called the Brethren of Purity, the Echona Safar, uh, who transmitted Gre uh, Greco Syriac um, uh, Hermetic documents into Arabic, who were in fact Ismailis, that is to say, assassins. <coughs> And brought that. Uh, uh, also, there was the whole Neoplatonic influence. There probably was a, a Manichaean influence. The Manichaeans being the great uh, Gnostic dualists of all time. Um, the Manichaeans believed, of course, that uh, the material world is completely evil, and that the world of good is a purely spiritual world, and that um, because the world of the flesh is evil, uh, and even the god of the material world, Jehovah. Yahweh is a stupid demiurge who thinks he's God but isn't really, uh, is in fact uh, worse than Satan uh, because he created this evil material world which has uh, kept us all from a uh, reunion in heaven with the pure spiritual principle. So this, this is about as uh, moralistic a stance towards the flesh as you're likely to find in the history of religions. Oddly enough, however, once you make that jump to that ultimate morality of the condemnation of the flesh, then you tend to say one of two things. Either all the kings and rulers of this world and even of the universe should be overthrown because they're all mean sons of bitches who are keeping us from heaven. Or you say, well, if the flesh is evil and only the pure spirit is good, then it doesn't matter what we do with the flesh. And in fact, we should probably exhaust all the possibilities of sin. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Rasputin had this idea. Uh, Rasputin was a Gnostic dualist in this sense. You exhaust the flesh right, by treating it to every one of its most awful desires, including for murder and incest and whatever. And uh, this, you know, then this presumably leaves the spirit free to rise above the, the evil flesh and go, you know, directly to heaven. Do not pass. Go, uh, you know, do not collect uh, your purgatory cards. <laughs> so um, the uh, I don't want to make fun of Manichaeism. It's a beautiful religion. Uh, there's uh, exquisitely beautiful documents to be read. Um, but they did have a very conspiratorial point of, uh, a point of view. They were hated by all the other organized religions. They did organize themselves in a rank, a hierarchical rank of initiates in which the initiates at the bottom rung knew very little and the initiates at the top knew everything. They did uh, launch campaigns against states and religions. They were a revolutionary force. And it is the assumption of, of, the, of the great conspiracy theorists that the Manichaeans, in a sense, lie at the root of all conspiracies and secret societies. If not in a direct historical line, then <clears throat> because they are the archetype 
of the revolutionary secret society. So there is a way in which we could say that the assassins were Manichaeans. Uh, I personally would, would also raise a lot of arguments against that. But for the moment, I want to emphasize the, uh, the uh, conspiratorial revolutionary aspects that come from Manichaeism to the assassins. And then presumably, if we make this presumption, to the Templars and to the Templars to the Masons. Um, the, uh, it's important to, to realize, I think, that the uh, secret society, wherever it appears, almost invariably takes a certain form. I call that form the Tang, which is the Chinese word for a secret society, uh, just because it seems like um, it's a nice, uh, handy term to refer to a whole range of phenomena in history. Uh, it always it always has a mutual mutual aid aspect to it. And in fact, the early Masonic clubs were uh, known uh, as, uh, just like the Chinese Tongs because they would collect money from all the members for the widows and orphans and for the emergencies that the members might have. They acted as insurance company, communal, uh, mutual insurance uh, funds before uh, insurance, the idea of insurance was invented. That's always a very important function of the secret society. They're also almost invariably arranged in a pyramidical hierarchy. Uh, they almost always have a gnosis or a secret doctrine that unfolds step by step as you move up that, that pyramid. Um, and uh, the, in other words, there's an inner and an outer truth, not only a, a truth for people outside the society, but even a truth for those people who are inside the society but still outside the inside of the society. You know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, the, highest, the highest level of Gnosis is always said by their enemies to be, quote unquote, atheism. In other words, uh, free thinking. Uh, the truth of the matter is that the highest levels are usually uh, mystical and revolutionary. And this appears to the orthodox mind as a kind of atheism. Somebody want to open the window a little more? It's getting awfully stuffy in here. Also, I can really use a glass of water from um, And uh, almost, all rev almost all secret societies I mean, what is, what's, uh, mo what is enough of a motivation to make one go in for all this kind of thing is usually a political uh, or religious revolutionary goal. Uh, so the Tongs, the Chinese Tongs, were interested in overthrowing the alien Mongol rulers. The assassins were interested in overthrowing Orthodox Islam. The Templars were presumably interested or became interested after their fall in the overthrow of the Catholic Church. The Mace Freemasons have been accused of being interested in the overthrow of monarchical governments and of the Roman Catholic Church. The early early Communist Party. So, oh, and interestingly enough, you can make a historical link, just as the right wing paranoids do, uh, between all of this and Karl Marx, who, as a young man, was a member of certain societies which were offshoots of a Masonic offshoot called the Carbonari or charcoal burners. <clears throat> who had been a very active revolutionary group in Italy under Garibaldi and also in France and other parts of Europe. So <clears throat> Marx himself has a, a strong Masonic input. And in fact, the, uh, the uh, uh, Nestor Webster types who, who, who ran and rave about um, communism as really Freemasonry, you know, there's some truth to it. Um, it's not an adequate explanation of history, but there's some truth to it. So I think that we've gone back far enough. I mean, we could carry now this idea of Gnostic dualism and the secret society back to the Stone Age. You know? uh, let's go back to 1717. Let's jump back to 1717 now and try to understand what the meaning of the founding of the, uh, not even in America yet, right? uh, what the meaning of the founding of the Grand Lodge was. Um, basically, at least in part, it was certainly a coup d'etat to take masonry out of the hands of Scottish aristocrats who were Catholics but liberal Catholics, actually bad Catholics, but Catholic, and into the hands of good, upstanding British bourgeois gentlemen who were Protestants. Uh, so there was a chauvinistic and religious purpose to this coup d'etat, this founding of the Grand Lodge in London, and the saying that we British are the center of May Freemasonry. We always have been and we always will be. Uh, which covered up the entire Scottish origins of Freemasonry until very, very recently. 
And the Scottish Rite and masonry was thought to be a later romantic invention. It has nothing to do with Scotland. It now turns out it had everything to do with Scotland. So, um, and there was a, there's a very important, there's a key figure called the Chevalier Ramsey, uh, R-A-M-S-E-Y, the, the Sir uh, Chevalier was his French title, meaning knight. And he was an agent for Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Stuart Pretender, to the, the uh, Scottish and English throne. Uh, he intrigued for uh, Stuart uh, interests in France. And it was he who, who introduced the so-called Templar ranks into masonry, the Templar mysteries. And so he's usually thought of as this whacked out proto-romantic uh, nutcase who made up all this stuff about the Templars. The truth now seems to be that Ramsey was, in, was actually in touch with secret Scottish transmissions, uh, and, uh, that he really did know what he was talking about, and that it had been decided <coughs> in order to push Stuart interests to, uh, to revive the Templar connection in a very distinct way uh, to um, stir up Scottish opinion and French opinion against the English. So Ramsey was a real schemer in an, in an, in an age of, of great schemers, which included Cagliostro and uh, the Comte de Saint-Germain and all these kind of quasi-Masonic charlatans or sages who were wandering around Europe leeching off of the aristocracy, uh, publishing weird books, uh, pretending to change lead into gold, etc., etc. Ramsey was one of that crowd, the sort of Al Alistair Crowley of his day. And a uh, very interesting, very unfortunately not studied enough figure. Like it's, uh, I would be happy to write a biography of this man if I could find some material on it. Um, in 1737, he founded the Scottish Rite and the Templar Degrees in France in the name of a mysterious Grand Master who was probably the Bonnie Prince Charles himself. Now, from that foundation, there comes uh, the, back into orthodox, so-called Orthodox English masonry, eventually began to absorb these uh, Scottish degrees. But you know, on the continent, a much more interesting thing happens, and that is the rise of the Grand Orient Lodge, uh, which uh, was always a rival to the Grand Lodge in London and in the early 19th century actually proclaimed that the, they were getting rid of the Grand Architect of the Universe Clause. Um, they weren't even going to believe in some kind of wishy-washy, tolerant, interfaith God anymore. They were going to admit that they were out-and-out -out atheists, or at least mystical agnostics. At, at this point, the Grand Orient, this would be about, oh, I don't know, 1801 or something like that. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm a bit vague on that date. At this point, you're, uh, English, English Masons throughout the Grand Orient and the Grand Orient sort of floated off on its own and gave rise to all sorts of delightful things, uh, including, actually no, it would have to have been before the turn of the century. Anyway, the, the most important one in 17, a very significant date, May Day 1776, ring a few, that should ring a few bells, was founded the Bavarian Illuminati by uh, Adam Weishaupt, uh, a, a former Jesuit professor of canon law at Ingolstadt University in Bavaria. Uh, they call themselves the Perfectibilists, which rings a bell with the perfectionists that I was talking about. Uh, they had three grades. The, uh, the, uh, the underlings were called Minervals. I don't know exactly what that means. But the second uh, rank were called Scottish Knights. And the third rank, the third rank was known as Magus or King. Uh, some very famous people joined the Bavarian Illuminati, including Goethe, also the, uh, some local uh, dukes, the Duke of Weimar. Uh, but uh, within, uh, well, a very few years, by 1785, the, the uh, Bavarian Illuminati were banned by the Bavarian government uh, for, for being way too involved in revolutionary politics. And in fact, the Illuminati are usually seen as the focal point of all the radical anti-monarchial elements that came into masonry. And um, as opposed to the English masons who are really now interested in being loyal, patriotic, Protestant, upstanding businessmen, you know, slap on the back, kind of, you know, elk type of masons. <laughs> <laughs> on the continent, things were seething, you know. Mysticism was hot, political intrigue was hot, 
uh, left-wing politics was hot, and all this kind of mix was all mixed up uh, with um, Weishaupt and the Illuminati. He also had American connections. The choice of the date, May Day 1776, seems uh, too much of a good thing to be a coincidence, really. Um, there's no doubt that, uh, in any case, Illuminati agents were somehow involved with American Masons who, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, the connection is there. It's impossible to put your finger on it. You can't name names. There are no documents. But it's a good assumption that American Masonry, which was gung-ho for the revolution, the anti-British anti revolution at that time, would have been in close contact. Lafayette was, uh, Lafayette was, uh, was a, a Grand Orient Mason. There's a, a great quote some friend of mine found, Lafayette to Washington, 1784, in a letter. Quote, having gone to all the lodges, I could find I know as much as any sorcerer ever knew, says uh, the famous Marquis de Lafayette to the famous George Washington, who, you know, fathers of our country, you know, the rationalists, deists, um, scientific, uh, Democrat talking about being Maguses and joining secret Illuminati societies. Yes, every single one of the founding fathers was a Freemason, with the one exception. Anybody know who it was? Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, the true radical, the real Democrat, was the only non-Freemason. George Washington had himself inaugurated in a Masonic apron. There's a painting of it which appears in many histories of masonry. They're proud of it. They don't try, they're not trying to hide that. Um, and since then, every American president, as far as I know, with the possible exception of Kennedy, who presumably would have been excommunicated if he had been a Freemason, uh, but I think he was one anyway. I think he was both, both a Freemason and a Knight of Malta. Uh, every single president has been a Freemason. Our present incumbent is a Certainly no exception. Um, all right. Oh, yes. And, of course, the, um, in France, post-1776, the um, Grand Orient Masons got deeply involved in the French Revolution, as you would well expect. Uh, Thomas Paine may have been the link here. Um, it, it, he was a, a very good friend of Dan Franklin, who was probably the Grand Master of, of American Masonry. Um, and at, uh, there's a persistent legend, a very nice one, very scary but nice, that when uh, the king of France had his head cut off, a uh, lone figure leapt out of the crowd and onto the platform and dipped his handkerchief into the blood and waving it in the air said, Jacques de Molay, thou art avenged on this day. Jacques de Molay was the head of the Templars who had been killed by the king of France in 1307. And that they had waited that long for revenge. Declared it. It's really it makes a nice story. You know, it's sort of Alexander Dumas type history, but uh, anyway, there it is. And then I mentioned the Carbonari, who later grew out of the Grand Orient tradition. And people like the re revolutionary, 19th century revolutionaries like Bakunin and Marx were fascinated by Freemasonry. They, they uh, had great envy of this um, amazing, long lasting secret society, and they were always, uh, at least in their early days, uh, Marx got much more sensible later on. Bakunin never did. Bakunin was always trying to start some secret society, revolutionary brotherhood, um, in, in basically an imitation of the Masons. You could say that all secret societies have been imitations of the Masons since uh, their founding. Now, finally, we're going to get to America. I've been, uh, uh, I mentioned George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. <coughs> Franklin, by the way, was also a member of the famous Hellfire Club which was a group of make-believe Satanists, uh, undoubtedly also another Masonic offshoot, founded by Sir Francis Dashwood and John Wilkes, the uh, famous uh, Whig, radical Whig politician in London. And when Franklin visited them in England, they would go to Sir Francis's estates in, uh, in, in Mednam, which were, where he had a cave dug out in the shape of the female reproductive system, uh, which is still there, which is still there, can be seen to this day. And um, they would dress as monks, they called themselves the Mad Monks of Mednam, and they would drink and uh, frolic to their heart's content. And uh, of course, the hoi polloi, the mere peasants, didn't understand this and thought that it was Satanism. And who knows, maybe the peasants were right. One never knows, do one. 
Um, meanwhile, all sorts of other interesting things were happening. Uh, the, whereas George Washington and his cronies were, even though they were anti-British, they belonged to the London Grand Lodge organization, the rank-and-file uh, military people, the, the soldiers, the, or the, 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 the private soldiers in the, in the Continental uh, Revolutionary Army tended to belong to a rival organization that had been founded in Ireland called the Ancients. Uh, um, and who, who were until well on in the century remained in rivalry with the London Grand Lodge and handed out these um, uh, lodge certificates to um, uh, soldiers everywhere. And so this kind of Irish masonry or rogue masonry of some sort was per permeated not only, I mean, not only was the official brand of masonry permeating the upper reaches of the intellectuals that, or, or the doers, the George Washington, Madison, uh, type of people, but it was also permeating the lower ranks in the form of this kind of popularized Irish masonry, which in 1741, a very key year for, for a lot of things, um, held a big march in London where they called themselves Miserable Scald Masons, S-C-A-L-D, Miserable Scald Masons. No one has ever explained this term. Uh, Masonic historians just dismiss it as a, as a spoof or a parody. Um, uh, but it's much more likely to represent the one surfacing of it, uh, the one official historical surfacing of an underground proletarian mason that was big in Ireland and in America. So just that's just to complicate things even more. Um, on the subject, uh, oh, by the way, on all of this subject, I could not uh, go without a hearty recommendation of Robert Anton Wilson's historical Illuminatus trilogy, which is into its or, or series or whatever it is that's into its third or fourth or I don't know how many volumes there are now, but he deals with all of George Washington as a character in it. And he's the hemp-smoking George Washington, the hemp-smoking Masonic mystic. Uh, so Bob sees a kind of interesting positive side to all this. And as I said before, that interesting positive side is there. You know, before the whole thing collapses into a control conspiracy, there is this, uh, this interesting freedom of the spirit this, uh, you know, esprit uh, would be perhaps an even better word, uh, exemplified in, in, uh, in, in mysteries like the uh, unbelievable success of the American Revolution against the greatest uh, military naval uh, power in the world. How did that happen? A lot of historians are coming to the conclusion that it was it involved some collusions between English Masonic officers and American Masonic officers including, uh, what's his name, at Yorktown, the one who just didn't, uh, Cornwallis, who was a known mason, who uh, just simply didn't do anything for day after day after day until Washington got, you know, everything the position and people said, you know, why? Why was he so inactive? Why was he such a slug of it? Well, it happened that they were both members of the same Masonic Lodge. You know, that could explain it a little, couldn't it, maybe? So, Basically, what we've got now is two strains uh, going. One is um, revolutionary but bourgeois masonry, and the other is uh, pure Jeffersonian radicalism, which is really, for the first time in revolutionary history almost, just not interested in secret societies. Jefferson wanted everything out in the open. And this is why they had to wait for him to go off to France, they had to send him off to France as ambassador to ram the Constitution through. The, the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation had been genuine radical revolutionary documents. I mean, as radical as it got for the 18th century. Uh, egalitarian, you know, the, the equality, fraternity, pursuit of happiness, you know, the most rad, probably one of the most radical ideas ever written into a, a nationalist founding document. And something had to be done about that, you see. That was not good. That was not good for trade. Uh, so, um, at this point, Washington and his cronies, who had been the revolutionary Masons, now found themselves in power and still Masons. So, what do you suppose American Masonry would become from that point on? It would suddenly do a flip-flop, it would turn into its opposite, you know, uh, it would use the same images and the same symbols, but they would now symbolize something completely different and even opposite from what they symbolized before, and if you want to read the text, there it is. It's on your money. The pyramid, the eye in the pyramid, the in God we trust, 
the uh, Novus Ordo Seclorum. All those things are Masonic symbols, and they're on our money. Right? Uh, there can't be a clearer indication of where Masonic imagery and power is going in American history than to put it on the money, which is the quintessence of, of control. You know, whether you're a capitalist or anti-capitalist, it doesn't matter here. The analysis is the same. Money is control. <coughs> and that's where the Masonic symbolism goes. The Statue of Liberty, by the way, was a gift from French Masons to American Masons. Well-known fact, uh, although largely forgotten, and you're certainly not going to hear about it on the tour, go on the tour bus. <laughs> <laughs> the Constitution was a conservative Masonic coup d'etat. Uh, it's a, a basically a Masonic uh, manifesto, but one written now not from the revolutionary point of view, but from the point of view of control, of a, of a group, of an interest group which has seized control of the very first country ever to be founded on the basis of paper. You know, we are the first and probably to this day the only country that was founded just on the basis of paper and the declaration of what we believe to be self-evident truths. Uh, has now has now uh, the same clique that achieved independence is now interested in in, in a national aggrandizement and class aggra aggra aggrandizement, and so um, they have to hammer hammer through this document which centralizes control, which creates a monarchical presidency, which we're still suffering under today, uh, which makes it almost impossible to change the law, etc., etc., etc. I don't want to make a big argument for this. Bazins and Lee have done a nice job of arguing this in their uh, uh, temple in the lodge. There are other people who have said this. The Masons say it proudly. <coughs> they say, yeah, we, we influenced the Constitution, that great document. You know. To me, it's always seemed like a, uh, a devilish document. Uh, it seemed like the, the stominous betrayal of, of, of the American Revolution. Can you give me five seconds? Sure. Oh, all right. How, what, how, how am I doing for time here? What's the, uh, good no, one hour. Not. I've gone one hour. Mm -hmm. oh, I might actually get through uh, soon enough here to uh, have some conversations for a um, So as a mechanism of conspiracy, as a mechanism of control, Freemasonry obviously must move ever farther to the right. And it was this movement that occurred while Jefferson was away in France that brought him scurrying back to America. Oh my God, what are the Masons up to? And uh, managed to get the Bill of Rights tacked on to the Constitution. And uh, to, to this day, I still, uh, as, even as an anarchist, I still have a kind of uh, sentimental attachment to the Bill of Rights. You know, I, I, I don't like to see it uh, smashed under the boot heel of pushing in history, you know, of Reagan Bush history. It upsets me a great deal because it's like this one last little breath of the true democratic revolutionary spirit that had inspired the, the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation, and which was now being flushed down the drain by Washington, who had become a uh, rigid, a reactionary, and proved it by immediately smashing, violently smashing, the first two rebellions that were raised against the Constitution, which have gone down in history as Shays' Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion, as if all these people wanted to do was get drunk, you know. Of course, Father George couldn't let that happen. What they were really, uh, what they were really protesting about was the imposition of tax from the central, from the newly centralized government, federal excise tax on, on all of their products, not just whiskey. Uh, and Shays' rebellion was similar, similarly inspired. And of course, Washington and his Masonic cronies uh, uh, crushed these uprisings. Everyone was to be forced into a single nationalist mold, and this general trend. You know, which I also began to outline in the 19th century, and which I think culminates, finally succeeds in the Civil War, which once and for all decides, yes, it will be one nation under God, one president, all organized, all members, the same thing, same vote, same economy, same dollar bill with the same pyramid and the same eye. You know, and uh, that that was Washington. That was the Washingtonian dream, and that was finally realized in the Civil War. Because there was, you know, a lot of struggle, a lot of development, a lot of becoming, a lot of evolution and devolution in between those two moments. Uh, but I'm not concerned with those, uh, with that in-between history. Now, so we have to do another stone skip over the waves of history here and get quickly to the 20th century. And um, basically, it's 1945. 
coincidentally, the year of my birth, the year of the atomic bomb, and the year of the digital computer. Uh, some would say the beginning of the modern world, the real modern world. Um, a year also, I would since I refer to uh, Robert Anton Wilson's fictional evocations, I will also give you Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow and his depiction of what was going on in the zone, the rocket zone, the, uh, the still chaotic, unsettled area, ever shrinking area of chaos in Germany in 1945, where a lot of historians would see all the most important trends of 20th century history since then beginning in that one little spot of time, that one little moment of chaos, uh, uh, and that one little, actually, you know, very heady freedom in a lot of ways, because there was no, got, nobody was in charge, you know. And into this, uh, into this area of, of, or, of disorder uh, flowed all the forces of 20th century history that would succeed. Any, everyone who came out of that crucible transformed that moment of, of total disorder, the total breakdown of order, so beautifully evoked by Pynchon. Everyone who emerged from that emerged a winner, emerged except for poor Slothrop, of course, uh, the hero of the novel, <coughs> who I think gets in, ends up getting shot out of a rocket or something. But uh, all the real players, all the big time players, emerge as winners. They emerge with. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the map of Europe and indeed the whole world redrawn and basically we've been living that we've been living the results of that moment I think ever since it's only very very recently that the actual people of, of, who, who gained power in that moment have begun to die uh, and you know for most of my childhood the so-called world leaders the great world leaders that I grew up with were the people who had been there for the slicing up of that particular pie and they're only now beginning to die, and we're only now beginning to hear some of the score. Uh, researchers, uh, generally the kind of researchers who are condemned as conspiracy nuts, have been <coughs> digging, scraping, scraping away at this weird moment, this 1945 moment, trying to, trying to understand what happened. And finally, some of what they've uncovered simply can't be denied because it can be documented. For example, that the OSS, the American Military Intelligence Service, at this moment completely absorbed uh, the whole Eastern Bureau of Nazi Intelligence under uh, Reinhard Galen. This is a known fact. It's in history books. Uh, no, one in the, no, no one in official history ever seems to sort of meditate on, on how strange this fact is. I mean, we know about the rocket scientists. We know about the rocket scientists. But the whole NASA story is boring. NASA went nowhere. Space is nothing. What was really important there actually was not the rockets. It was the intelligence trade-offs that were going on. Now, who were the Nazis? <laughs> um, <laughs> one guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they came out of something called the Thule Society, T-H-U-L-E. Uh, actually, Freemasonry was banned under Hitler, along with all rival occult organizations. Uh, because the Nazi state was to be the one and only true Freemason in, uh, in the view of the full society. Uh, they, like, like so many of the other offshoots of the Grand Orient, uh, floated off on their own, developed a, uh, a, an ideology of rigid right-wing reaction and control freak mentality, and uh, actually, actually succeeded, you know, as you know. Uh, between the First World War and the Second World War in establishing that occult state called Nazi Germany. And when I use the word occult state, I mean, again, big grain of salt here, all those books on Nazism and, you know, the Third Reich and the occult without any footnotes at all, you know, forget it. I'm not depending on those, but where there's, some, where there's smoke, there must be some fire. And some things are known. Some things are known. You know, it is known that Hitler had an astrologer. You can read it in Alan, uh, what's his name, Olaf. You know, it's in there. It's in there. It says, he just says it, and then he goes on. He never discusses the significance of it. Must have had some significance that Hitler had an astrologer. Must have had some significance that 2,000 Tibetan bodies were found in the ruins of Berlin, etc., etc., etc. These things must have meant something. And uh, it's the assumption of, the, of Karl Oglesby, great conspiracy theorist, for whom I have a lot of respect, a very sane and level-headed guy, 
who says uh, that, whose motto is there is never just one conspiracy there are always uh, many interlocking and uh, conspiracies in rivalry uh, or, or mutual support I mean so uh, conspiracy any conspiracy theory would, would say they're all Manichaeans or they're all Freemasons is automatically to be ruled out of court in Oglesby's uh, version of history Nevertheless, it gives a very convincing, I'll let you find that out for yourself, very convincing presentation of uh, the, the subsequent history of Nazi intelligence within the American intelligence community, traces it to the Kennedy assassination, to the rise of the Republican Party under Nixon, uh, uh, traces uh, connections, and here, here's where it gets the Freemasonic again, traces connections between the Nazis and the, the Freemasonic Lodge Propaganda Due, P2, as it's called in the, uh, in, the, in the newspapers, which is another offshoot of the Grand Orient, although even the Grand Orient has refused to, uh, at least publicly, has uh, denounced the Lodge P2, Propaganda Due. Um, Propaganda Due arose out of Gladio, Operation Gladio, which was the stay-behind intelligence operation in Italy uh, to make sure that the communists did not seize power. Uh, the CIA, as it then was, uh, uh, colluded with the mafia. I mean, this is all in the books, you know. You, you can find all this information if you want to. Col uh, even the official history books. Lucky Luciano went back, you know, was taken over to Sicily, flown over to Sicily in an army plane, so forth and so on. Gladio was the stay behind organization that was there to make sure that communism did not take over Italy. There were other Gladio like operations in other European countries, but the one that we're now finding out about is Gladio. And the break into Gladio came through the break in Propaganda Due, which um, basically had su such an amazing success that they had that Licio Gelli, the great Licio Gelli, the most evil man in, 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 in I mean, the, the, the one really, truly, honestly evil man. You know, even Hitler was like this, you know, whiny vegetarian. <laughs> I mean, Licio Gelli is bad. <laughs> you know, somebody once, he was boasting once that he said, I own both the Communist Party and the neo-fascists in Italy. And someone said, well, you know, who do you like better? He said, oh, definitely the fascists. And they said, why? And he said, because bank doors open on the right. And uh, another, another great quote. He is now living free in his villa in the Abruzzi and giving charming interviews to the press, in one of which uh, he said that when the uh, interviewer asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, he went, what he had wanted to be when he grew up, he said, I always wanted to be a puppet master. So this is Legio Jelly. He doesn't fuck around. And he suborned well over half of the Italian government through blackmail and masonry. He started out by, oh, and he's, he took an amazing career. He started out as a fascist officer sent to Yugoslavia after the war where he stole the entire Yugoslavian national gold supply. Uh, brought it back to Italy and set up the Lodge Propaganda Due which then uh, began through, through blackmail basically to sign up every single important Italian, every one of them, all of them. And uh, when through, uh, 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 because, well, complicated story, Roberto Calvi, the man who hanged himself under Blackfriars Bridge, supposedly a completely impossible feat, by the way, he was actually killed by Scotland Yard, which is a Freemasonic organization. But let's let that pass. Anyway, the scandal, the scandal that surrounded Roberto Calvi's death blew open P2 in Italy, and this one uh, journalist, whose name I forget, got himself iced, but uh, left some papers that got into the hands of the last honest judge, you know, in Italy, and uh, finally the case was cracked. And uh, it was revealed, first of all, that, that Jelly had uh, supplied both sides in the Argentinian English War with jet planes which he just happened to have, I suppose, lying around his villa. Uh, that he had um, been the runner for the Vatican to uh, Solidarno in Poland. He had been, he supplied Vatican money, he was the person who supplied Vatican money to Solidarno in Poland. That he had been photographed standing right next to Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan at their inaugurations. Uh, that he, you know, that his, uh, that he was absolutely through Archbishop Machinkus in control of the Vatican Bank, which was being used to launder all mafia drug money in the world, 
at that point. I mean, this was, this is, you, you talk, you laugh at conspiracies. You don't think there's such a thing as conspiracies. This was all in the newspapers. You could read this. When I was living in Italy, you could read this, and it was happening every, years before it happened. I was talking with a friend of mine, an Italian, who's a conspiracy buff about Freemasonry. And he said, of course you know the, the, the Vatican is completely permeated with Freemasons. No, oh, I didn't know that. Shh, the walls have the earth. This large propaganda to it. So he told me all about it, you know. And I knew this was all going to happen. Uh, and so I followed the whole story with great fascination. When Pope John Paul died in bed, he was not uh, holding a copy of the Imitation of Christ. He was holding a copy of the list of the Freemasons who, who had penetrated Vatican intelligence and banking circles. He died with a cup of coffee in his hand. Uh, <laughs> just like a Mikel Sedona. Uh, probably got it from the same takeout shop. Uh, Mikel Sedona, the, uh, the wonderful Nietzschean Sicilian banker who... Uh, came over and took over Franklin National Savings in America and ran it to the benefit of the Mafia of the Republican Party and all the players for a while until uh, finally his personal uh, shit at the fan. Uh, Licio Gelli got annoyed with him for some reason. He was extradited to Italy and, and died in, in prison with a cup of coffee. In his hand. <laughs> <laughs> Having predicted that he would die in prison with a cup of coffee. In his hand. Uh, so um, the, the connections between P, with P2 and the Republican Party are very, very clear. I mean, these photographs exist. I've seen them. Jelly was a good buddy of Nixon and Reagan. And I'm sure he's a good buddy of George's, too. Because George has been in intelligence for a long, long time. <laughs> George not, was not just an appointee as, as head of the CIA. George was a, a hard-working career spook. And um, he is, of course, a Freemason. He was a member of Skull and Bones, another favorite organization with the conspiracy buffs, the, uh, the Yale uh, fraternity, where so many of our great leaders emanate from. Uh, he's a member of the Council for Foreign Relations, of the Bilderberg uh, Foundation. He's a member of everything except the Knights of Malta, which is a favorite, or, you know, every favorite uh, uh, conspiracy buffs organization in the world, George is a member. And uh, now I come to uh, the real hypothesis that I want to leave you with. Um, considering that <coughs> election day is coming up, I think it's important for you to meditate even on such insane ideas as I'm about to present to you. <laughs> Jack Herrer, H-E-R-E-R, -E in a book about marijuana called The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which is really very interesting and well worth reading. Uh, alleges that both Bush and Quayle have strong family connections with Lilly Pharmaceuticals. Now, Lilly Pharmaceuticals played an interesting role in the history of intelligence because when the CIA started Project MK Ultra, which was a mind control experiment to be carried out with LSD and other so-called psychotropic drugs, they didn't want to buy the LSD from Sandoz, the Swiss company which had invented it, they wanted to buy it from a good, safe American company. And they chose Lilly. Lilly uh, synthesized LSD for one customer and one customer only, the CIA. And they did such a good job that they created, a, in my view, the CIA is largely responsible for the psychedelic revolution. Um, acid slipped out of their grasp and got into the hands of such notorious freaks as Timothy Leary. Uh, there's an interesting story, by the way, that Leary was supplying acid to a woman named Mary Pinchot who, was su who supplied it to Jack Kennedy. And according to Leary's uh, wonderful autobiography, Flashback, best title of anybody's autobiography ever had, uh, 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 Pinchot, was, Pinchot was telling him that, uh, Leary, that was telling Leary that Kennedy would have been, uh, was, was getting enlightened. And the reason why he wanted to pull out of Vietnam and get, you know, get out of Cuba and do all these kind of peace things that he was getting interested in was because he was becoming an acid head, thanks to Mary Pinchot, who, oddly enough, ended up dead <laughs> a few months after Kennedy uh, in a murder that was never solved, even though her husband was Cord Meyer, one of the major CIA agents. Uh, <laughs> really, it's <laughs> 
absolutely just too much. Uh, he ended, ended up dead on the uh, uh, canal towpath in Georgetown. Case never solved. Case closed, like so many of the other killings connected to uh, the Kennedy assassination. So, um, now, as you know, with the death of communism, uh, we have to find new enemies. You know, the, the control, the, the, the factors that control our government are in desperate search for new enemies. Uh, one, one, one really good enemy is the enemy within, the drug, the, the drug user, the, uh, the, the evil, inhuman, uh, you know, fourth column of uh, crackheads, whatever. This makes a very good enemy. You know, you can never be sure that the person next to you isn't an agent for that drug virus conspiracy. You know, it, it cooks up a good feeling of paranoia and so forth and so on. But you can't blame everything on interior enemies. You know, a strong, upstanding country like America must have exterior enemies as well. I mean, suppose we want to go to war. <laughs> suppose we need a little war, you know, to juice up the economy. You've got to have somebody out there to hate. And the clear choice of the Republicans is the Muslims. You know, I don't think there's any doubt about this. The evil Saracen, the, uh, the wicked Sultan, the lusty Turk, has been resurrected as the you know, most popular enemy of, of, of United States intelligence and control circles. In other words, back to the Crusades, right back to the politics of the Song of Roland, and uh, the um, liberation of the Holy Land, you know, which is still uh, still needs to be liberated or at least protected against those wicked uh, Arabs. Um, they, you know, belong to a, an, uh, an alien religion which is nevertheless so close to ours we sometimes have trouble telling them, telling it apart. And you know, there's nobody that makes a better enemy than your neighbor, your closest neighbor. Islam, in the history of religions, is our closest neighbor, and therefore it makes a very convenient enemy. Where, you know, where do you suppose this tradition emanates from? Um, the Masons have always had a very interesting double view of Islam. On the one hand, the Rosicrucians claim to have attained uh, their secret knowledge in Yemen and Morocco, obviously from Muslim alchemists. Uh, Islamic imagery keeps up crop keeps cropping up over and over and over again. In masonry, you have the shriners, the, the shriners, the so-called shriners, the guys who ride around in little cars with fezes and the parades. You know, it's actually called the ancient Arabic order of the shrine, the nobles of the shrine, uh, the, with the Mecca and Medina lodges. And, I mean, the whole thing is like a parody of a weird kind of parody of Islam. And you can find this interesting misunderstanding of Islam. Uh, in uh, throughout European history, I mean, everybody from Voltaire to Nietzsche were Islamophiles. They liked Islam. They didn't understand it. They didn't know anything about it, really. But they liked it and admired it. Why? Because they were anti-Pope. They were anti-Catholic. They were anti christian They were actually anti-Christian. I mean, Voltaire and Nietzsche, the whole freethinker tradition, which is of course very important for Freemasonry. Uh, has, has, has always been anti-Catholic and anti-Christian in general, and therefore this kind of feeling of closeness to Islam. At one and the same time, remember, who were the Templars? They were set up to be the, the hammer for Islam. They were set up to be the destruction of Islam. They were the Templars, and the other uh, Christian knights were there not to become interested in Islamic culture and start wearing kaftans and smoking hashish, which is probably what they did. <laughs> they were there to kill Muslims, right? So there's always been this double thing in the Hermetic Masonic tradition, uh, this double view of Islam. On the one hand, it's a secret ally. On the other hand, it's a public enemy. Now, if you analyze George's activities in the Gulf, um, and the rumors that, and, you know, and ask yourself actually why is Saddam Hussein still on the throne, uh, and, and, and begin to take a little bit seriously the ravings of conspiracy maniacs that, in fact, Bush was in touch with Saddam Hussein. We know he was in touch with Saddam Hussein. He was selling him weapons for decades. Uh, there's no question about that, but that the whole Gulf War thing was a, a setup a collusion between Bush and Saddam Hussein that resulted in 200,000 innocent people getting iced. You know, this makes you stop and wonder. As to, it makes you wonder, you know, uh, like, what in the hell is going on? Well, I have a little hypothesis as to what is going on. You see, now, if Bush and Quayle had those family connections with Lilly Pharmaceuticals, and because of MK Ultra, 
the CIA needed LSD, and if George was a good, loyal soldier in the CIA, who do you think was the bad man between Lily and Richard Helms? Who carried the acid? Who carried the acid that, as uh, Marty Lee has shown us, these, uh, these spoofs were dropping in each other's coffee? Uh, you know, they were playing all these games with. Who was the disseminator of that acid? Who do you, you know, who do you suppose? I think it was George. And I think George dipped his finger in the bag a lot of times. I mean, if you just look at the man on TV, he's got that clenched jaw look. <laughs> and if you read Marty's book, Marty Lee's book, um, Acid Dreams, you'll find out that all these spooks had bad trips. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, George, Gordon Watson, the guy who discovered the magic mushroom, on his second expedition already to Mexico was penetrated by the CIA. Um, Marty discovered there was, a, there was an agent on the trip. Gordon and all his friends saw God. The CIA agent had a horrible time. Spent, his, spent, his, spent the whole night in a fetal position by the fire. Saying, his Indians are trying to get me. <laughs> he had a pick. And, and the spooks, I mean, what would you expect a spook on acid? <laughs> they had bad trips. All of them. They all had bad trips. So I think, you know, Bush went out of his mind decided that he was the Masonic Messiah, he was there to smash the Saracen and restore the Holy Land to Christendom, and at the same time to perpetrate the power of his class, his race, his special interest groups, which are the same special interest groups, race and class, that have ruled America since 1789. And we are now living through George Bush's bad flashbacks. <laughs> So just remember that when you, uh, when you go out to vote, and uh, I guess I could uh, open it to uh, conversation now, so if anybody has anything to say in response to this total insanity. Yeah? What about Bill Clinton and Al Gore? What well, I... Did they have any connections? I really don't know. I don't know. I assume that the Masons and they're, they're probably uh, crawling up to 33 degrees at this very moment. <laughs> But you'll have to ask the press here. Yeah. What was the Bohemian Grove? Ah. Uh, what is the Bohemian Grove? Do we have any experts in Bohemian Grove here? John knows uh, more about it. Africa, anyway, it's a little woodland in a redwood forest in, uh, in Marin County. Yes. Yeah, it's Sonoma. What is it? It's in Sonoma County, yeah. All right. It's just, it's said to be. It's said to be just a sort of vacation spot for the players, you know, the big players, the, the CFR and the... Uh, yeah. Read their memoirs, they're always going out there and having a wonderful time. And the assumption is that they cook up conspiracies while they're there, you know, horseback riding and drinking champagne or whatever it is they do, yeah. Is there any connection with the speculation of the fact that the United Nations and the Bush administration is so reluctant to intervene with certain crisis. Well, yeah, right. I mean, the victims are Muslims. It wouldn't look very wouldn't look very good for Bush to come to the defense of them, would it now? And if he does happen to win, which may happen, I'm not going to be surprised. I'm not going to be surprised at all. Um, what do you think is developing? In, in Yugoslavia? Yes. Gee, I'm not following it on like, you know, the kind of day-to-day -day basis that uh, I have to go back and look at these things several years later to find out what happened, you know. But, um, uh, I wouldn't wouldn't think that it looks very rosy for the Bosnians, no matter what's going to happen you know, for the for the Muslim population. Yeah. Wouldn't doesn't look very rosy for the Muslim population, no matter what. You know. the joke. Who loses that the war between Serbs and Croats? The Muslims. Yeah. Right. Yes. If this to be served, uh, Sorry. Can't be uh, We will ride to the rescue just before the battle and have three the last. Yeah. We will save from death, right. but not from subversion. Yeah, we can drop powdered milk yes. and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Or, or, from another perspective, the Muslims will get pissed off and find a new system, therefore, there's not a new system. Yeah, well, um, the image of a united Islam is, is pretty much a hallucination. It's perpetrated <laughs> by. Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
I mean, not even the Arabs could keep it together. You know, the United Arab Republic, which used to be, you know, here's what Iraq, Egypt, what else, who, was, who else was Syria? Who else was in it? Sudan, I think, for a while. They could, even the even the Arabs, who all speak the same language, uh, couldn't keep it together. You think the Muslims can keep it together? There's no caliph anymore. You know. There's no Darul Islam. It's, it's all a big mishmash of competing uh, wacko ideologies mixed in with the, you know, a very strong tradition of which the Khomeini people, the Khomeini types, can draw on the strength of that tradition to put their wacko ideas out there and make it look very monolithic. But it isn't monolithic at all. It isn't. There, there, is, no, there is no Islamic core poised on the horizon, you know. They're not at, at this time or in the foreseeable future. By me, okay. I mean, yes, Islam is resurgent in some way. Yeah, there's stirrings in the East, you know, kind of thing that the British agents used to say to each other. But uh, what, what, it, what it means, you know, what it means for history is not at all, not at all clear, and one should certainly not jump to any conclusions about. Uh, about, crusade, about the, uh, starting the Crusades over again. You know, the more we the more we think in those kind of terms, the more we fall into the Bush type of uh, uh, patterns of thinking. Uh, they're the real conspiracy nuts. You know. Yeah. What, what I'm saying is that in the sense that uh, perhaps through some form of intermediation, the Muslims would have been That they could do. That's, that's what I'm saying. That they could do, and if, they, if one didn't happen naturally, they could create one. Yeah. Anthony certainly feels it's significant that Sarah Bones was created the year that Germany kicked out the last of the Lodge. Do you think there's any. 1784 or yeah. 5? Yeah. Huh. Nice. He, he said, it, he said <laughs> Neil supposedly got a donation from some wealthy German noble who wanted to remain nameless, and that's how Stone Bones started. I like it. I'll add it, I'll add it to my routine. <laughs> Jefferson would say he thought that the tree of liberty needed to be periodically watered with a little blood. Uh, he was certainly capable of, of trying to throw a, a, a you know a permanent a glitch into that document in order to see that that blood would flow. Have you ever noticed when you ever ask this professor that question, you get a little nervous and you start talking about mystical meanings? Yeah, well, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dare get anywhere near a university campus with this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> They have me tarred and feathered for sure, yeah. Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about it. I don't know much about it. It seems to be almost a kind of independent conspiracy. You know, it doesn't, I, I can't see, I can't figure out how, John, do you know how the vote scam thing links up with any other conspiracies? I asked George Floyd, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's basically about fixing voting machines, right? Yeah. 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 See, the thing, the thing that puzzles me about that is I don't see why that's necessary. We've, when they've already pushed the buttons behind everybody's neck, you know, to make them vote the way they really want to, why bother to tinker with the machine? That's what I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, we all know that the people don't elect the president anyway. The Electoral College says that, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, okay, I'll try, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, no, you, 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 This is something that uh, uh, Berger and Powell said. Oh, there were 200 of them. Oh, really? Well, in the subways. Uh -huh. uh, in Morning the Magicians. One of the most highly wicked books ever written. <laughs> uh, but why is that? 
Well, because they're not sure of medicine. <laughs> <laughs> that to me is wicked. I mean, they made, I, they made accusations like George, uh, George Gurdjieff was a Nazi agent. They said that in a book. I mean, come on, you know, you've got to prove shit like that. You can't just say things like that. So it seems that there, was some, that there may have been, on this point, they may have been right that there were some Tibetans in Berlin. And that they may have been uh, uh, brought there by, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, the, uh, uh, the Spear of Destiny has a lot of The Spear of Destiny has a lot of this. Right, 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 right. However, in court, Rafus Prof said that he got a good amount of that book through uh, channeling. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that book is a yeah, footnote there, right? <laughs> 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 But, uh, I see your Rosicrucian man in the other so, uh, uh, My link is uh, one of the only things that my race that ever appeared in English until Just recently, yes, was in uh, Bal's version of the book translated from the French. Right. And uh, the, he was the, at, uh, the Grand Master of uh, uh, the Munich uh, Lodge. Of the who was? The Mayor. Mayor yeah. was the Rosicrucian Grand Master? Right. So, I mean, I know this, all this is so tangled up, and I wanted to bring it up. I don't know, it's uh, hard to follow all these different lines, but as I told you, I read this book, which is now out in, uh, in the United States, which I showed you uh, the sign and the seal about Ethiopia, mm -hmm. the Knights Templar, mm -hmm. like uh, how they were destroyed after the first Ethiopian embassy appeared uh, at the uh, court of the Pope in France, and uh, that the Knights Templar were always in search uh, the Holy Grail, which is equated with the original Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. taken out of uh, Jerusalem and brought to Ethiopia. What's the name of the book again? Uh, uh, the Sign and the Seal. The Sign and the Seal. By Graham Hancock. And of course, it also brings up uh, Portugal as well as Scotland as a place yes, where actually, that's true. people yeah. went. That's right. And it's strange that every time any foreigner ever came to Ethiopia to investigate the Nile or to whatever, you know, things would already been found that they always came from Scotland and Portugal and turned out to be Freemasons, mm -hmm. and that the uh, uh, that the author of this book uh, got on this particular scent uh, when he went uh, after writing the introduction to a book on Ethiopia, a book of beautiful photographs called African Art, that he went to for a vacation to Chartres, and that he saw like in this uh, in the Chartres Cathedral certain things which showed a relationship between Solomon and Shiva and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, all of this, well, where did those Gothic cathedrals come from? Mm. We're also related to the Knights Templar as yeah. well. The writing of Parsifal. Yeah, no, that, that much is clear. You know, and uh, which comes up again in the Spear of Destiny book. In that the book, they, uh, they, 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 Cathedral, have you read that? The Mystery of the Cathedral, the, the alchemical symbol. Was that Fulcanelli? Yeah, Fulcanelli. Which uh, certainly proves the hermetic program of the cathedral. Yeah. What is the actual source of power which holds the Masons together? I mean, there seems to be so many conflicting things. And I have two questions. How do they look at our friends and colleagues who are, who are Masons? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. well, I told you yeah. with a big brain of salt, right? I mean, the, the, the question is, what is the power of the Masons? And, and, and what about the Masons, you know, work, work in the office with them? <laughs> Well, you know, a little while ago, or, or in fact, in, in some of the research that I that I was doing here, I, I went to the Masonic Library on 23rd Street. It's a very interesting place, and uh, anybody can go in and use the library, as far as I can make out, which makes the Masons a lot uh, a lot nicer than Columbia University. <laughs> and, uh, but I have to say that. Uh, that the whole thing was was not you know the you know, sinister cloak and dagger you know I mean it seemed very innocent it seemed a little dusty and most of the material there was about how American Masonic lodges are cooperating in the Ronald McDonald uh, orphanage uh, program McDonald's is a Masonic plot right I don't know subvert the idea of food. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not a mason. Uh, I, I know masons. Who, you know, masons have their own opinions, uh, often quite uh, opposed to each other about the origins of masonry. They argue about this themselves. 
It's a big deal for the Masonic the Masonic historians. They have a actually a very interesting journal called the uh, uh, Latin site, I don't remember, but it's a publication of the historical lodge in London. There's a special lodge that are some of the historical. What? The Palato is the uh Quatuor Quatuor Coronati Lodge. Quatuor Coronati Lodge, right, which is the, the Masonic historians. And they have a wonderful time, you know, uh, going over all this stuff and reviewing everybody's books and you know agreeing or disagreeing. And they, you know, they, they they don't anymore, of course, usually literally adhere to the Hiram of Biff and the Temple of Solomon legend. You know, they're willing to see this as something that needs to be uh, interpreted metaphorically, um, and they've done a lot of valuable work. I mean, they have the work that the Masonic historians have done, the task of some future Francis Yates who will finally put all this stuff together and make some kind of sense out of it, you know, would be made much, much easier. So, you know, I don't know. I really, and, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, everything I've said tonight would be complete crock. You know, <laughs> and it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference because it's still an interesting metaphor. Now this, I, I, you know, pardon me if, if, if this sounds like a cop-out. Uh, and the truth of the matter is I do actually believe a lot of what I've said is literally true. Uh, but it's only a matter of belief, and belief isn't worth much in the history game. Uh, but you know, even if even if I could be disproven on every single point in terms of the literal reading of history, I would still say that this makes an interesting metaphor, you know, for what uh, for what what is happening to us as Americans under the reign of, of the intelligence uh, agencies. You know, that in fact, I think it is apparent by now that, that America and probably other countries as well, some of the Italy for a long time, have been run by spooks. Not by statesmen, not by politicians, not by soldiers, which even that would be better. <laughs> you know, give, give, me a, you know, give me an honest rule general any day you know, over, these, uh, over these spooks, these, these, uh, these slimy liars whose whole entire training is to lie about everything and to never let the right hand know what the left hand is doing, to never tell the people anything, to assume that the people are Marx, you know, that the con is in. I mean, William Burroughs predicted all this years ago. He read The Naked Lunch, you know, it's all there. The world that, the, the world that we're living in, that hideous world that Burroughs predicted, you know, it's just like, you know, he's a great man, but Jesus. This is horrible. You know? And so all of this stuff is meant as a lighthearted metaphor for what is really a very disgusting and sad situation, which is that we have, we have let our lives be, we have let ourselves be pushed around by spies, by cheap spies. And not only that, we idolize them. The way we idolize the cops. You know, the way we can't turn on the goddamn television without seeing a cop worship show. Uh, the next higher intellectual level is spy worship. Why <laughs> the BBC is trying to special on spies? You know? <laughs> it's the liberal version of cops. <laughs> <laughs> and we just stand still for this shit. And that's, you know, I'm trying to make a joke out of it to a certain extent. But I also literally do believe some of this to be true. Yeah. Uh, my father was a 30 third degree Scottish Red Mason. And he's been a member of the Masons for 40 years. Um, I think when we're talking about the Illuminati and the Masons, it's important to consider a couple of things. The shrine is uh, it's a social branch of the Masons. That's what they say. No, it is. He's a member of it. Yeah. For the last hundred years, we've been Have you ever read the Shriner legend? Yes, I have. It's, uh, for a historian of religions, it's a fascinating ah. document. Yeah. Uh, I, I know what you're. I know what you're saying. You know, millions of dollars. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. But uh, they also claim to be descended from the Bektashi Sufi order, uh, which is one of the most interesting of all the heretical Sufi orders, uh, which were who were uh, uh, basically the uh, power behind the Janissaries, who were the palace guard for the Ottoman sultans. They claim to have an origin from uh, one of the Ottoman sultans. They claim to have um, Ismaili connections. I mean, the, the Shriner legend is a very, very peculiar and interesting document, and it's not about driving around in little cars raising money for, for crippled children, which they do, and hats, you know, a tip of the fez. 
to them for doing it. But the legend is very interesting. I suggest you have a look at it and meditate about it. They are greatly offended by most of the conspiratorial theories about them. As far as Reagan... Well, sir, wouldn't you adopt the position of being deeply offended? It's important to consider that Reagan and Bush were not members of the Masons. They never have been. The Masons believe that the true conspirators in this country are in four primary groups. The Knickerbocker Society in New York, the Bohemian Groves in California, and the Olympic Society. Reagan and Bush were both members of those groups. And the Ivy League. They feel that if you check the history of the country, the Supreme Court, the Congress, the White House, the Cabinets, and Wall Street, as well as most of the captains of industry, have been... So you're saying that inter-Masonic circles have their own conspiracy theory. Yeah, they do. I'm very... Thank you. I like hearing that. It's a very interesting point. And you're right. You're absolutely right. But remember what Oglesby said. There's never just one conspiracy. Of course. You know, there's always a conspiracy of interlocking conspiracies. Yeah, 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 there's always a conspiracy of interlocking conspiracies.
Right, right. Uh, thank you. That's very interesting. I, I know there are more questions. I hope uh, I hope that you'll come and you'll save them until next time. Uh, the fourth lecture will be the last in the series. We'll try to bring it all up to date uh, and resolve the uh, the Taoist dialectical problems that were raised tonight, and talk about uh, radical neo hermeticism as a possible viable paradigm for the future. So. Francis Yates' book on Bruno.